<laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is John. Say hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> uh, John is our subject today because uh, John, when he was three years old, knew that he wanted to be a fire truck. And uh, when that didn't work out, he went to college and he got himself a job as a systems engineer at Block Blister Video. <laughs> and that was like 10 years ago when he left college. And so uh, when layoffs started happening and his friends got laid off and he got all of their work, and then his boss got laid off and there was nobody to advocate for him when layoffs came around again. And now John is out of a job and didn't know that he needed something called a career. He just knew he had a job. And he wants to go find the very next job that looks exactly like the very last job he just had because he knows how to do that job. And it doesn't require a lot of thought. The problem is, is that the chances of John being successful at this next job and being happy are pretty limited. Because the only thing he's doing is looking at, well, I used to get beat Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays over here. Maybe I'll only get beat Tuesdays and Thursdays over here. But you're not actually finding the thing that's going to make you happy, are you, John? No, no, I know. But that's because you don't have any help. But I got news for you. You got help. Lori, would you like to introduce me? Yes. <laughs> oh, the, the words are here. It's a little, we had, we okay. had a, we've got, we got a little thingy we wrote. You know, sometimes you read the script and sometimes you just do it from your heart. This is Bryna. <laughs> and this is from the heart, but it's been a long morning. <laughs> this is Bryna. She's a right brain, project managing, humanizing DevOps maven. And the co-founder and co-chair of DevOps Day LA who currently happens to specialize in helping people figure out what they want to do next in their careers. And this is Lori. Applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lori is a left-brained, conference-dominating, career-redefining, tactical warrior, hiring manager, and engineer. Don't forget any of that. There's a test later. She's also a current chair of Southern California Linux Expo, and not en enough of a badass, she's the founder of Raise Me. You can applaud, you can applaud again, because that's why <laughs> we're all here. Thank you. Lori happens to specialize in helping people take their dreams and turn them into a reality. She and her Raise Me team, with an awesome resume, a focused job search, and some butt-kicking interview skills. So uh, we're doing this for points in heaven. Uh, we're not recruiters. Uh, we've been shit on, just like all of you. Uh, we see our friends get shit on, and we want to do something about it. Uh, so I'm going to help John figure out what he wants to do, and Lori's going to help him go get it. So the first thing that needs to happen, John, and you're just going to kind of sit there while we talk about you for the rest of this talk. You're fine, right? Okay, good. Um, so... What happens is when you get laid off or when you're thinking about moving on to the next thing or uh, you're, you're, you're trying to get promoted, what you really need to do is you need to clean up after yourself. Um, the, in, the instinct to reach out to people after you've been laid off that you've already worked with is not, it's not great, right? You don't really want to talk to those people. They've already thrown you out. Um, or you're trying to get promoted away from the team you're on or the boss you're with. It can be really hard to try to get feedback. But gathering feedback from where you've been is really essential. It's going to help you figure out what your direction is forward. If you're trying to figure out how to move, uh, move on and you're already in a position, start working yourself out of a job. Find who really owns the work that you do, who you should hand it off to. Document the hell out of everything you do. Leave plenty of breadcrumbs so that you're not leaving your organization, your coworkers, your team, your boss in a bad spot after you go. Make sure everything can move on. If you're angry about where you are, work through it. Do not take that anger to the next place you go. It's not fair. You've got a new company, wants to give you a new shot in a new position. Don't take that, 
anger about that last boss and that dumb company that wasn't paying any attention to you and wasn't helping you grow, that's not your new company. Bring your good feelings to your new company and all of your aspirations. So John, um, the way that I did this was uh, I got laid off from Verizon a few years ago. Nothing about Verizon. I was making too much money. I was too good at my job. No innovation was happening. They saw an opportunity to let me fly free, and I flew free. Um, but I got a career coach, and he said exactly that. Reach out to every single person you know and tell them that you need a job. That's the most embarrassing thing in the world. I couldn't think of anything less I wanted to do than tell everybody in my network how awesome I was that my last company wanted to pay me to go the hell away. That feels terrible. So instead what I did was I went home, I got a little drunk, and I wrote uh, <clears throat> Help a Bryna Out at the top of an email. And I thought, what do I really want to know? So I wrote, uh, I'm trying to pimp my resume. And since you know me in a way I don't and in a way others don't, I need your honest perspective. What words would you use to describe me personally? What words would you use to describe me professionally? What job titles would you give me if you could give me any job title? What accomplishments would you suggest I highlight and what things should I do better? Uh, and uh, I sent it to the career coach I was working with because I was still scared of sending it out. And as soon as I hit send, I realized that I needed to just rip the Band-Aid off. So I sent it to my ex-CEO. He said the nicest things about me. He wrote pages of awesome things, suggested I highlight stuff I hadn't even thought about, talked about the impact I'd had on the company over the course of six years from his perspective, which I always thought was a small thing, but it ended up being huge. And I ended up being able to build my entire front page of my resume based on my CEO's stuff. We'll talk about that later, but boy, did that feel great. So then I started sending it to everybody I knew, people I worked for, people I worked adjacent to, people who worked for me, friends of mine, people I had been, I had uh, known in other jobs before, things that I had done. Um, and it really helped me understand uh, some things I could fix about myself, um, some places that I was better than I thought I was. But the thing it really did, um, when I put it up on a spreadsheet and I wrote Help a Bryna out at the top of it, I printed that thing out and I put it on my refrigerator. And when I was looking for work and I felt like I was valueless, I would open my fridge and I would see that thing and I would remind myself I'm exactly the same person I was the day that I was getting paid at that job and I'm exactly the same person the next time I get paid and all of these things are still true about me, I'm just not earning a dollar. And that's important. So one of the things I did was, uh, oh John, that's what we're doing, we're looking at your stuff here. Oh, this is cool. Oh, we sent this out for you, okay? So we reached out to people who, um, you volunteered at a nonprofit, and we got the, the woman who was helping you at the nonprofit. Uh, we got um, some, the, your last boss. We got some other people you worked for. We got uh, some people you were working with on an open source project for the last handful of years. And they gave you some really good feedback. They had some nice stuff to say about you. And the thing that you really learn here more than the information that you get back is you figure out who's going to help you. When you get responses that say, uh, I think that your next title should be exactly the same title you were at the last company, the person's not looking at your, at your prospects. They're not looking at your future. They're looking at what they knew about you and the perspective of their world is small. They see, they see their world, they see how you fit into it, but they don't see what your potential could possibly be. The people who say you could be CTO one day, the people who say you could be president one day, you want to get coffee with those people. You want to do that immediately. You want to keep them on your speed dial and you want to get in touch with them every single time you have a question about what you're good at, what you could be better at, and how you should grow your career. Those are the people that are going to help you make the difference. Because in every piece of feedback, 98% of the information you get when you get feedback from something, somebody else is about them. Only 2% is about you. And your challenge in the face of even the most withering feedback from your boss 
or from someone. If it's somebody random and you don't care what their feedback is and it's not going to impact you in five minutes, that's not feedback. That's trolling. If you want information from people who care about you and are going to help make you better, that's feedback. But you have to remember their perspective is what comes first. Your perspective is where you find the truth, you start the conversation, you start to work through it. I had a coach, uh, she was an engineering leader at a company. And uh, as she was getting ready to leave her company after years and years, uh, her boss, who she'd never had a relationship with, uh, asked for an exit interview. And as she sat in that exit interview, her boss said, you do not build good relationships with people. Now she had spent her entire career trying to build better relationships with people. She was an agile and engineering coach. She raised all of her, she had 300 people underneath her. She was well known for her great relationships with people. So why on earth would her boss say that? Well, she didn't have a good relationship with her boss. And what her boss saw was, I don't have a good relationship with you. I don't believe you have a good relationship with anyone. And so my coach in the exit interview, as soon as she got that feedback said, even out loud, 2% truth. You and I did not build a good relationship. It's a good place to start a conversation. But don't walk away and feel like it, it's, you allow someone to destroy everything you've built from an offhanded comment that happens to be based in their own reality and not yours. That said, um, so yeah, so who can see your supporters, people who see your potential career instead of your best jobs, uh, those who suggested titles for you beyond what you could imagine for yourself, former bosses, mentors, or coworkers who believe in you, have backed you up in the past, will continue to back you up in the future. Uh, people you admire and careers you want to emulate. Uh, God bless LinkedIn. We're going to talk about that later, but LinkedIn is full of people whose careers you want to have. You do. Or, well, better than that, too. Um, so, the next thing you're going to do, John, because you've sent out emails, you're waiting for those to come back. While you're sitting around waiting for that, uh, you're going to start a wish list. You're going to start a list of all of the things that you want your life to look like. You're going to think about what you want your day to feel like. You're going to think about what your work environment is like. What industry do you want to work in? Um, oh, here, I've even got some examples. What work environment do I want? Quiet, collaborative, uh, working from home, working on a beach. I I've heard that a couple of times over the weekend. We're talking about more remote work, especially because of coronavirus. How exciting to go work from the beach instead of sitting in your house just because you're home quarantined. Trees don't have coronavirus, just saying. Uh, <laughs> what do I want my day to look like? Uh, do, I want, do I like the constant crunch and that adrenaline rush? Uh, do I want a structured release cycle? CICD is your friend. Um, do I want balanced days? Do I like working in the middle of the night? Um, what industry? Do I want to be in government or healthcare? Uh, technology is a really easy thing to say, but technology, I hate to break it to you, is not an industry. Everything has technology. There's all kinds of opportunities and places you wouldn't even think of. I work at Nordstrom. I'm not wearing my badge. I work at Nordstrom. You would never think, women's shoes, what technology could that possibly have? We, we run a fulfillment center. We have a production studio where we take photos. We actually sell things online in flash sales. We have online off-price stores and websites. There's an amazing amount of technology that goes into all of this. What type of company do I like? I like a nonprofit, a large international company, a mom and pop shop with three other people. I want to be the only engineer. I never want to be the smartest person in the room. Uh, what role on the team? Do you want to be manager, the senior guy? How about the guy who fixes all the bugs? Who wants that job? Somebody wants that job. It might not be me, but somebody loves that job. Um, but ideation takes time. So you want to take time and you want to write out everything you can think of. Keep the pad of paper by your desk, put it in your bag, take it with you, uh, put it on your coffee table next to your coffee, um, and, and write down stuff you never even, like I didn't know that I could pick where I wanted to work. I swear to God, I had no idea that I could even choose. I didn't even think about like, you know, you think about like how far you want to drive. I don't want to drive any further than the west side. I don't mind driving downtown. I'm not going to Irvine. And that was it. 
He's like, I need to be a project manager somewhere in that area. That, that doesn't tell anybody any way that they're going to be able to help me out and help me find the job that I'm really well suited for. So when you're done with your list, and it's going to take a little while, uh, you're going to break it down to 10 things. You're going to put them on a, on a spreadsheet. Uh, and Well, you're going to break it down to 10 things first, and then you're going to break it down to five. And it sounds really easy the way I say that. It's not really easy to do. We actually have two ways that we can do this. Because um, I'm all colorful, and uh, Lori calls me touchy-feely, and she's all logical and engineering. And so uh, everybody thinks in different ways, left and right brain. Um, so, John, we got you some top 10 here because you were writing like a madman. I mean, look at that. You got stuff all over. Oh, my God. Pages and pages and pages. Uh, so you got to, uh, let's see. Got senior title. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a good idea. Uh, don't want an open office. Sure, I understand. Kubernetes over AWS. You've been going to a lot of talks here at scale, right? All, all inspired. Uh, Well-established company. Block blister. Uh, yeah, left you, left you a little cold. Um, flex time, you want to be able to go to the doctor in the middle of the day and not have to like take off hours and take vacation time to go to the doctor. Um, DevOps environment, sure. That's really smart of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, high tech industry, uh, easier flexible commute, right? Uh, that last place you worked was like an hour and a half each way. You definitely want to want to shorten that commute a little. Attend one conference a year, maybe scale. Um, and bonus and stock options. A uh, successful company is a good company. Um, so the way that you whittled this down, let's see. Um, I say pick your favorites. Pick the ones that are deal breakers for you. Um, so as your you know, well-established company is a really good idea, because uh, Blockblister you know, you don't, you don't want to get laid off too soon. You want to have a little bit of time to have a career there. Um, the senior title, that's important because you're growing in your role. Uh, let's see, easier, flexible commute, right? We talked about how important that is to you. The bonus and stock options also. And uh, Kubernetes over AWS because, you know, you just can't fight with scale. Uh, and so you end up this way. And then Lori, uh, you want to you show John how you do your things? Yeah. You do it your way? So the reason Bryna and I are doing this talk together is because we are opposite people. Um, I respect the way that she does things. It's just the opposite of the way I would do it. I have another favorite way of doing things because I'm really analytical um, and I'm a recovering sysadmin and a programmer before that. Um, and so her way of doing the top 10 is to pick the 10 favorites. And this method actually puts me spinning in a loop. And so you have to find the method that works for you. And this is an important process. So I'm starting with John's, John, he, this is John's favorite, uh, these are his top 10. Um, and I use the opposite uh, technique. It's easier for me to pick the one out of this I could do without the most, right? So if I, if, if I had a job that had a lot of these features but I couldn't decide if it was the right one for me, here's how I would do it. I would, Lori's way, I'd eliminate that one first. And then, okay, the next least favorite is that one. And this is actually, instead of, it, instead of this taking days and changing my mind over and over, I'm now doing this in just a couple minutes. Out of all these, which, which one's the least important to me now? Oh, okay. DevOps, sorry, Bryna. <laughs> sorry, because the commute, I want my life back, right? And now we're left. Either way, whether it's left brain or right brain, we're left with these five most critical features, which we are now going to leverage. This, when I do this without a microphone, um, I actually hold my hand up and I go, these are the five points of your North Star. Because I like the idea of being able to take them with you wherever you go. Put them in my pocket. Um, so when you're walking around and you're talking to people and you're sharing the fact that you're looking for a new role, uh, even if you're in a role, you're still talking to friends about how you want to get promoted, how you want to start work looking at a new company. Uh, you've got a, this idea about this little consulting thing you want to do on the side, right? You take the five points of your North Star with you because this helps to guide every single decision you make. You see a job description, you see a suggestion, you come up with an idea, you're watching a TV show. You go, oh my God, I've already figured out exactly what features I need out of my next job. And this is the stuff that can't change. Right now, 
my next thing, these are my five points. The next time I go to look for my next thing, you're going to do it all over again because your life's going to be totally different. You're going to know new things. You're going to have new skills. You're going to have opinions about the place that you landed because of this, right? And you're going to try to figure out the seven degrees difference between where you landed and where you really need to be. And this is how you do it. This will really help you. So you take your inputs from the help of John out. You've got them on your spreadsheet. You build your resume out of them. You take the five points in your North Star. I love that animation, Lori. That was so great. Thank you. Wait, can I do that again? Can I do it again? <laughs> Boop. That was so great. OK. Uh, and then you use those to go on LinkedIn. And you find uh, people you want to emulate. You find jobs you want to get. Any other place you want to look, Lori is going to help you figure out how to go do all of this. But da How dreams come true. All right, so now you've got the, the left brain thinker here. So I, talk, I touched a little bit on this earlier, um, what job you want. Uh, there are a lot of factors to consider that aren't just salary, right? We tend to measure everything by salary. Unless uh, you're like me early in my career, I had a real salary problem because I'd worked for defense contractors and had a, really, uh, a sequence of very low raises many years in a row, and I had a salary problem earlier in my career, and I corrected it by going to a company that would give me a big bump. Most people are not in that situation. There's a lot of other ways to determine if you're a good match for a role and whether it's going to give you long-term growth potential. Okay, industry, what industry do you want to be in? Healthcare, uh, defense, aerospace, computer gaming, uh, maybe just startup, any kind of startup. What type of company? We've talked about this before. Large, make it corporations where you've got a badge and you've got process and procedure. Or maybe you like the little seat of your pants. Uh, startups where every person is vital and you never know what's going to happen when you walk in the office every day. What role on the team do you want? If you're a junior guy, maybe you want mentoring uh, opportunities, right? You don't want a lot of responsibility because you want to focus on developing your skill set. Maybe you want to be the senior guy who solves all the problems and tells the junior guys what to do, okay? Uh, growth potential is a very important aspect. The challenges, the technical challenges you get of this uh, AWS, Kubernetes, other good stuff you've learned here at scale, um, and career path. Uh, a lot of people go to startups because they, they want to they think, I'm going to be a vice president in six months, right? <laughs> Anything can happen at a startup, right? So career path is another thing that's important. So if the only thing you're worried about in your job offer is dollars, you're doing it wrong. Reprogramming you guys today, okay? Um, so uh, no, so I, I'm on a team of chairs here at Scale. Uh, I've been on the team, I think, 10 years now, and I reached out to them before this talk, and I said, where do you look for your talent when you hire? I mean, 18 years ago, when they founded Scale, they were all in college. Okay, 20 years later, these folks are hiring managers, vice presidents, right? These are all now senior people in their organizations, and guess what? They don't even use online job sites like they used two years ago. They don't find them productive. They use their personal networks to do hiring. So I just want to give you guys that feedback, okay? But the online resources are actually very, very helpful. Just don't depend on them completely, all right? And I'm going to show you how to leverage them. LinkedIn is in, we'll use two examples, LinkedIn and Monster. There are others, but, you know, time, time presses, okay? Um, so uh, here, are some, here are some examples. Um, Monster.com, I did a search for open source. <laughs> Guess how many matches I had for existing jobs on Monster.com? If you cannot figure out what your next role should be, given the five points on your North Star uh, and, uh, and what your background is, by doing this search and looking at these roles, maybe we're doing it wrong. Or maybe you should translate the page to English. <laughs> okay. So, and by the way, these, these slides are available. Um, here are places that you can find free intel. Always do your research. People go into job interviews and they don't ask any questions. This is the wrong way to do it. You do your research ahead of time. This is, all these resources are free. They're all public. And um, you can walk into the interview and you have questions for them. You should be interviewing that company as much as they're interviewing you. 
Uh, and uh, well, we don't have time to go through it. But th this again, this the slide's available. Um, so, what title? What company? All right. So here's where where people come to me. This is the, and and. This is where we're different at Raise Me. If you go to a, a regular career fair or you approach somebody whose job it is to recruit for given companies, the answer they're going to have to your question is, oh, we, uh, you need this uh, a junior, uh, you, need to be, you, you need a junior SRE role and we have one available in Tucson. And that becomes, and then that resume, <laughs> that direction becomes warped in that, uh, warped toward the roles that are available to that recruiter in their industry. A, a really senior recruiter will help you more beyond that, uh, but understandably, they have a job to do. Um, so your job is before you get to the recruiter, you need to go through this process and find out what is out there in the marketplace. So um, how many people are looking for roles? Do you know the titles? of the positions that would work for you. Is there anybody out here that's only looking for one specific exact title? So you know there's a few things, right? So um, how do you find out what the titles and what the roles out there are out there? Um, if you go to, uh, in this case, uh, if you go to monster.com, it'll create a URL for you. We're gonna do search on open source and then our favorite technologies, Kubernetes, AWS, senior role that offers stock options. Let's see what happens to that 150,000 matches. Wow. There really are jobs out there with my five points. Now, not all five points are things you can search on. It's not going to answer the commute question. But it's really going to give you a place to start. And look, this is real time. This is, I did this just a few weeks ago to, to make the slide for you guys. Uh, here's right on top. We've got, we're hitting all the nice. And if, you could, if we could scroll down here, you'd see down here that it offers stock options. Uh, so we got hits. And so just on that limit, we have uh, quite a few we can look at. And then now you can feed this information back in and you can also feed it into other search engines like LinkedIn. Um, uh, you know, a linear seed software engineer, a senior, well, okay. <laughs> Not everything's going to hit perfect. But you can go down and you can see which companies are hiring and you can do your, your research on those companies. Okay, and now we're going to try the same thing with LinkedIn. Uh, open source, Kubernetes, AWS, stock options. It creates this URL for us. What are we going to get? Look at this. Look at all these jobs. Okay, uh, and a little more variety here. Uh, but the same thing, you go, you mine through each of these jobs and you see what the requirements are for the job. And you can tell how well you match. It'll also inform you, what certifications do I need? to impress these employers. Oh, if I want a senior, what's the difference between a senior and an intermediate? Can I make that jump? This will answer your question. In this research, you don't need any professional's help to do. And you need to do this before you target roles. Okay? Uh, so here's another neat thing about LinkedIn. You can sign up for premium free and get it for a month free. I've never paid for it, but a couple of times I've done that. Miss Bryna had showed, tuned me into this, this really cool feature. Do you want to explain it? So, hang on a second, let me see how I qualify. I don't think you could get because I got premium. And it shows me, uh, based on the information that's on my LinkedIn profile, how qualified I am for this position against other people who are also applying for the same position. It shows me the level of people who are applying, it shows me geographically where they are. You find your competition's information right here on the page. If you're looking for a job, it's worth the $29 a month. Let me tell you to find out who else you're competing against. Because if all you've got to do is shift your LinkedIn and your resume to target yourself better and go get a meeting for this job, oh my God, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like an instruction manual on how to go get it. Okay, so here's the thing um, that I, I want to make you aware of uh, from a hiring manager's perspective. Okay. Um, you will sound like a better match and you will be a better match for a role, which means you'll stay in your roles longer and you'll get more out of it besides your paycheck if you create a career progression. Okay, so there's, there's a couple situations. Simple situation is you're coming out of your education, you're looking for your entry level junior role, whatever. You're going you're gonna to be at the very beginning of your career, if this was a career progression, um, and just getting your first job. Okay. 
Another situation is you're going to follow along that same career arc. Oh, I was an MTS1, now I'm going to be a senior staff. Same industry, same kind of work, just a lot more responsibility, different projects. Now maybe people are working for you, okay? And then there's re-careering or restarting situations. Re-careering is where you're coming from somewhere else. Let's say you're a senior programmer and you want to completely give that up and now you want to be a network engineer. That's not a huge, huge leap. You're not leaving the industry. But it is a jump and that it does require a little bit different thought when you apply for your job. And you have to do a little bit different things with your resume, okay? So one way or the other, no matter what the situation is, you're going to have a career arc. And even if it makes a jog, you're going to have, it's going to, it's going to arc. And this is a real-time example of somebody who was my client years ago, used with his permission. This is his LinkedIn profile. Let's see what he did. And let's answer the question about, if I haven't already done that job, how am I going to get hired for it? So if I'm a, if I'm a senior staff engineer and I want to be a, a, a team lead, how do I convince them I can be the lead if I don't have that experience? Let's see what this guy did. Okay, so we go down here, he's at Ticketmaster, senior system administrator for uh, a little bit less than two years. Okay, uh, I, if you're all familiar with those roles, that's going to be a high volume environment. They're going to have some security issues, and this is during the heyday, oh, to the, you know, in the, in the aughts, right? Um, so he learned some really serious senior system administration type lessons in that role which means you know a lot about what can go wrong, <laughs> about development, about network engineering, about diagnosing and troubleshooting problems, about, about releasing, about projects, right? So he, and so what's the next step up from the system administrator? Well, he wants to be a principal engineer. So he was able to convince DirecTV that his skills would place him there at DirecTV. DirecTV at the time, and probably still is, a little bit smaller company, but with a lot of the same challenges. So he makes a step up by going to a little bit smaller company, but still a world-class company, right? And now where does he go next? He wants a director position. Well, how did he persuade this next company that he was ready for it? Well, he probably had some lessons he learned as a principal engineer, responsible roles, deploying brand new state-of-the-art technology. The difference between a director and, an, and a single contributor is usually either you have people reporting to you and you have a budget. Not always. It's usually the first junior level executive position at a larger company. Okay? And then, well, uh, why he was at TrueCar, I assume they switched to DevOps. Or they were a DevOps organization from the beginning. Because he took his DevOps expertise to eHarmony, the largest dating service on earth, and his large scale experience here, and persuaded them that he was going to be in charge of DevOps, which touches everything, right? And then now he's, so he's at eHarmony um, for, oh, a little bit less than a year. What does he want to do next? Senior Director of Technology, Operation Security with Heal Incorporated. It's not as large a company, okay? You see how he's moving up? So let me ask you, what's up here? Somebody answer the question. What do you think this role is up here? A VP position. CTO, maybe for a smaller company, right? They're equivalent, right? We, we know this guy is not going to go be a staff engineer somewhere. We know he is using every jump he's making to get a new title, new responsibilities, new challenges, different work environment. What can we assume happened with his salary? Right. No guarantee, though. Right? When he went from eHarmony Director of DevOps to Heal Incorporated, I have no, no insight to this. But I'll tell you, that could have been a hit. Are we willing to take it, salary-wise? Because in the long term, he's going to be up here, okay? He's going to have stock options, he's going to have a piece of the company, he's going to be on a bonus program, he's going to be calling some shots. And that's clearly what he wants to do next. He's going to be in the job that he wants to be in. He's going to be in the job, but it's on a career path. And so the next person who's reading his resume and looking at his profile is easily going to be able to picture him on this. He's going to look like a good match, even though he's never been vice president of anything. It's, you, can, you can see it, right? So how many people in this room want a different title, different position next on their career arc at their next job? I mean, you don't have to be looking for it. You want to do something different next. Here's how you do it. Okay? It is a mystery, and this is, this is the mystery solved. Okay. Um, 
So I wanted just to inform you about the, about the hiring manager's perspective because when you're sitting across the interview table from them, sometimes, so, sometimes you're, you're kind of involved in your own perspective on things. The purpose of writing a resume is to communicate to a hiring manager and persuade them that you are qualified for the role they have open, that you're a good match. That's the, that's the purpose, okay? You need to get calls back from people. It's not a book report that talks about everything you did in your life. You're only addressing one person in one role, okay? Because of that, the steps are serialized. Purpose of a resume is to get your calls back. It's going to serve as like a table of contents about what you want to talk about in the job interview, okay? Get your call back. What's the purpose of a call back? Get the interview, okay? Purpose of an interview. It has a purpose. You're not just going and living through it and hoping you hear. The purpose of the interview is to learn about each other, to learn how good the match is, so that you can enter into a well-understood negotiation, so that you know what they're going to offer. You know, you got the range, and they know what you need. Oh, he needs to work, he needs to be at home on Fridays. Um, you know, he needs this salary range. Uh, he's looking forward to going to scale every year, okay? And the purpose of the negotiation is for offer. It's at least one offer, it could be an iterative process, but you want to have an offer that's going to be very close to the mark, right? And there may be a couple. And this is, we do a clinic here at the end of the day today that's on interviews and negotiations. It's not about winning, it's about finding a good match, okay? So um, the raise me approach is different from other resume approaches, okay? Because I'm a hiring manager, not a recruiter. And I often do this talk, or talks like this, with recruiters just so you can hear them disagree with me, okay? Um, but the raise me resume approach um, is mostly about resume development as a process with a purpose, okay? It's not a one-step process where you write this book report about your life and then blitz 20 employers. You're 20 best leads with some generic version of your resume. You create a master resume first, and put in it all of your experience, your educational accomplishments, your volunteer work. In a master resume, no one's going to look at but you. It's 10 pages, 20 pages long. Get it out. Put it in there. That's your book report. Then you convert, you convert that information into bullet items. And with each targeted job you look at, you pull up on resume, on Monster, it's got a list of requirements that that hiring manager has said they want. You pull out the information from your master resume that matches, that answers those questions. So, um, example resume development process, here we go. Um, is Tyler in the room? This is actually one of our uh, <coughs> Raise Me volunteers. This is his example. He started out, here's his narrative. These are the jobs he's had. College student still. Okay, a lot of it's about his volunteer work. But he's just writing it all down. He's just getting it down so he doesn't forget. And now what do you do with this? You can't use this as a resume. I have seen resumes like this for people that want to make six figures. This is not a resume. This is part of the process. Then you convert those to bullet items. Way too many bullet items. For each job, you had 30 different things, maybe, that you accomplished, that you learned, that you want to talk about. Not for every job, but maybe for jobs where it matches, okay? So you put it all in there, and that's your encyclopedia. And from there, you create a targeted resume. You look at the job posting, you look at what matches in the job posting, and you pull it over, and this is what the hiring manager needs to see. The hiring manager doesn't need to know about your paper out when you were 16 years old, okay? But your hiring manager does need to know about that interesting project you had in college 10 years ago that actually hits the nail on the head for the role they're looking for, okay? And you might not remember it if you didn't have it all here to start with. So this is a process with a purpose. And this is an iterative process that teaches you what your career arc is. But if you skip all this and you just write a resume to send it to everybody, you're not going to go through this process. We, here at Raise Me, I can't tell you how many people we have said, start over, you need to do this. And they've come back to us with a completely different idea about what they wanted to do for a living. Completely different. We would have wasted our time because they realized, oh my goodness, every job I've ever had, I've always been the jack of all trades that solves everybody's problem. That's the role I want on the team. I don't really want to be the senior guy that just, that just you know, solves certain, um, uh, certain questions that the, that the executives want to see solved, 
right? Uh, they want to do everything, right? So you, they learn about themselves and they can translate that to, con to, to the conversations with career consultants, hiring managers, and recruiters. Okay, um, how are we doing on time? Can somebody give me a time check? Oh, we've got 10. Ten okay, better wrap up. Uh, so uh, qualifications. Um, so, once, uh, so once you get your, your, your uh, master written, then you can tell whether or not your qualifications are really gonna be a good argument for whether you're qualified for a job. You never exaggerate on a resume. It's not necessary. If you feel insecure about your qualifications, this is what you need to focus on. Okay? Skills, experience, accomplishments, and education. Okay? Conventional qualifications are ones everybody recognizes, especially the big companies. You're in your current role, let's say you're a system administrator, and you want to learn about network engineering. Okay, what do you do? Well, uh, you're going to write some scripts that have to do with uh, maintaining uh, the network hardware. Okay? You lean over in your current role. Technologies are often very similar to each other. Okay? Uh, you can do casual consulting on 1099. Uh, which means take a job on the outside, but it's not a full-time permanent job. They don't have the same stringent requirements uh, as a full-time permanent position would. Uh, you can get a college degree or be in a certificate program. Those are probably the most expensive ways to get qualifications. Industry vendor certifications and training. Okay, these are conventional. Now, what if... Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and here's some examples, and, and this, this, this slide is available, by the way. You can take a picture if you want. These are just some of them. But we, we can talk about them in, in, uh, when we have more time in, in the, in the um, clinics, okay? Um, there is, what is, but what if you want to make a change? What if you do have that fine arts degree or a, geo a PhD in geology? First time I did the talk here uh, two, two years ago, um, a, a guy came up to me and he said, I have a PhD in geology. Nobody will call me back for a junior programming position. I've been doing programming for 10 years. But he was so qualified as a geologist, nobody, they, they, he didn't look like a good match. So what, what do you think was going on with his resume? PhD this, publications that, talk this, uh, he wrote, you know, edited a book, I don't know, right? So what, what doesn't go on that resume? None of that stuff. You don't lie, but you don't emphasize all of your accomplishments. It's not a book report. You want to put the things in the resume that actually apply to the role. If he's looking to re-career into a programming role, he needs to throw out the accomplishments that don't apply and talk about the programming he's done over the years, right? Especially if he's contributed to open source. So um, the problem with re-careering is when you go to larger companies that have well-established HR departments, and they, you have, will have difficulty getting hired in these positions. Here at Raise Me, we help hiring managers with that language. I have a talk I do just for how to have a reborn or somebody restarting after being out of work for a while, how to put them in a role on your team, even though HR says they have to have a master's degree or four years of experience. It's all doable. They're all guidelines. They just need to give HR the language that will make their argument. Okay. The HR people are doing the same thing that engineers do. They, re they create repeatable processes that'll uh, make their processes more efficient and low risk. And so the same thing they'll, that worked last time, they'll do over and over. Go to this college, this degree, this many years of experience. What does that do to an engineering team? It homogenizes it. So it happens because they're doing a good job. But the best engineering teams, the most robust engineering teams, are diverse teams. We all know that. You're sitting there, nobody can see the problem, and some guy in the corner goes, oh, duh, I did that when I was in you know, high school. And then you got your problem solved, right? You need the different voices from all over. So I'm gonna jump in right here. If you don't have a master's degree and you see a job description that says it requires a master's degree, don't let that keep you from applying. Let them weed you out. Don't weed yourself out. You are way more qualified than you think you are for most of the jobs that say they require certificates, uh, diplomas, uh, yeah. Okay, and so here, and here at Raise Me, we will actually help you. The resume clinic is next. I will actually sit down with you. We'll do our best to mine things from your background that can answer those qualifications. It, you may not be a perfect match. They want eight years, you've got four. You're still answering the qualification in your targeted resume. So here's the ways to build up unconventional qualifications. Number one, Contribute to an open source project. You want to be a Python programmer? Go program in Python, drop it in, a, in Git somewhere. And the hiring manager can see the quality of your work, how you interact with the community, what your documentation looks like. It takes all the risk out of hiring somebody. Uh, you could do volunteer work, work for free. 
here, come to, come, to, come, to, come to scale, help run network cables, run the AV here, write software, right? DevOps day will, DevOps day will, and not only that, you, if you work for me, I'm a chair, if you work for me, I am a reference. Okay, um, speaking at user groups, so if you can't even find volunteer work to do, you can write a set of slides and speak at a meetup. Okay, and by the way, you put those slides up on LinkedIn and put, it on, put the link on your, res, on your resume so the hiring manager can click a link and see it, okay? Online skill builder sites, we all use those, right? Hackathons, competitions, CTFs, oh, right out there in the hallway, we got a CTFs, okay? Other ways, you put those unconventional qualifications on your resume, they give you so much to talk about in a job interview, you can sound exactly like the person they're looking for, even though no one's gonna put hackathon champion as a requirement for a job posting, right? Okay, and so, um, sometimes I get asked, if we have time, I can do the slide, or we can talk about it later. Um, okay, so we'll wrap it. So, so some people, if, so like I said, Raise Me is not about trying to move you from company to company, from job to job. It's one way to do it, but it's actually very disruptive, right? You, I want to make sure that people exploit the situations they're in as far as they can and make the move with, when they, <laughs> with their left brain fully engaged, okay? Um, so here are, there's, there, there are six different points that managers hiring, that, that will create, will help you, put you in a critical mass situation where you're ready to be promoted, okay? And this is my opinion as a hiring manager. You'll probably hear something a little bit different from people in other roles, okay? Um, yeah, we'll go over it. Uh, oh, and there is one thing to avoid. Some people, some people will, Put, will, will threaten to quit if they don't get a promotion. This is something that people do as, to leverage to get a promotion. And there is actually a valid, it's actually valid to go to a hiring manager, especially a large company, and say, you know, hey, I got this job offer, I want a raise or I want a promotion. It is valid to do that, but you need to realize that hi, I, I recommend hiring managers don't do that because those are people that they're going to lose anyway eventually. They're already unhappy. What you care about is fixing the situation you're in for a long, not a one moment fix, but a long term career arc. So the, so the underlying problems in that role have to be solved first in order for you to stay there in the long run. That's my opinion, okay? Um, oh, and then I have other slides I do, uh, I get asked about consulting. So I have other content for if people ask me about consulting. And uh, this is where you can get help. Um, ShellCon, uh, so like I said, Raise Me came out of the InfoSec conference ShellCon, which was founded three years, uh, this is our fourth year, three years ago. The ShellCon booth is out there uh, in the Expo Hall this weekend. Um, and Raise Me um, uh, was born there. And we do now, this year, we do one Raise Me event a month at different conferences. Um, and um, I, I, we did have a full schedule this year, but I'm not sure exactly what's happening. But we will be around at least in meetup groups. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and as ever, we are completely volunteer driven. Um, they are all volunteers that, that will be, do consulting appointments for you. Um, and the people out front, Marcus will um, set you up with an appointment anytime during the day. Go to your talks, you can come back. And uh, Lori and I are here all day. Oh, shoot. oh, there we go. So we'll be here available for consulting. We've got some other speakers. We've got an uh, interview clinic and a resume clinic coming up. Right? That's, yes. Yeah. And John Sicklick, where's John? <coughs> John Sicklick, he's a professor um, at a local university. He's been a mentor uh, for many, many years. Uh, he wrote a talk for us, um, and that is at 2 o'clock. Um, and his talk is on open sourcing your career. And we'd like to thank our John. Oh, <laughs> yes! <laughs> Doing such a great story. Thank you, Craig. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the resume clinic is next. hiring manager over here. Why? How does that happen? How does template job postings go out? We're, we're busy. It's kind of hard to articulate what we want in the role. We just want to be put in front of people. Now, I'm not like that, but I'll tell you, I've still sat across the table from a candidate whose resume was just so off the mark, I just wanted to send him home with homework and say, you know, we need to talk. We need to talk again on the phone when you've put more of this stuff in your resume and I can consider it. I've definitely 
get to the end where I'm expecting to get questions and I get crickets. And there is nothing more disheartening than having someone who is totally uncurious about the job that they're applying for, about the company that they're coming to work for, about the boss that they're about to get. They don't even have a single question of what their new role is going to look like, what their day is going to look like, what their career path might be, what other opportunities might be in the future. Because to Matt's point, if I'm hiring you, it's because I've got a problem I need to solve. But when you, who are so awesome, you're going to solve that thing in a month for me, what's the rest of your career in my company look like? I haven't even thought beyond you solving this problem. You need to tell me what that path is and what we need as an organization. That's why I'm hiring you as an expert. So if you can't sit in an interview and tell me, okay, when I solve this problem for you in one, I see that your organization actually needs this kind of program to prevent you from being in the situation again, and I can solve that for you and spin that up, oh my God, I'm going to hire you on the spot. Yeah. So here, in Matt's... <laughs> We'll, 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 uh, we're going to have a real example of that later. And we're going to rip everybody a new one. Okay, yes. So, but I just did a job interview on Thursday, and I got to the end. They said, do you have any questions? I thought, oh, really? They answered everything that I had a question on. And I was tired. You know, <laughs> in the afternoon. You know, and I'm thinking, I should have more questions. I was totally blank. So that sends me the signal that you're really not interested. It does. Sorry, even if it's not true. Yeah. Actually, um, I, that's a great question. I want to cut it off because there's an interviews clinic this afternoon. So it's, it's all interleaved together, it is, but I know people are going to come back for that. They're going to want to hear it. So if you could be here for that, bring your, bring your idea right back. What I've, what, the purpose of this is, is I want to show you how the resume sets off this cascade, but it all starts with what's on your resume. Okay. Now, um, so an effective resume. So people... When people write resumes, they think that it just ta you, all you're doing is talking about the job that you want, right? But actually, a good resume, a resume that's persuasive to me that you're a good match, implies what you don't want. If you want to work for a little startup company where everything you do is critical to the bottom line and you don't know what challenge is coming next and you might be vice president next month, if you want that, if that environment's what you want, that goes right at the top of your resume. I want that. So what happens when the guy who works for Kaiser Permanente, uh, you know, and their thousands and thousands of employees with their badges and their, and their structured processes sees your resume? Is he going to call you back? No. Do you want that call back? No. Do you need it? No. And that's exactly what you want because here's why. Not only would that call back mean nothing to you, if you're too generic on your resume, the guy who works for the startup is going to go, I need a stress junkie, <laughs> right? But if he sees on your resume that you just love having challenges come at you from everywhere, he's going to go, or she's going to go, oh my god, I need this guy on my team. I, I need to figure this out. What, what role can we give this person? Something will resonate for them that makes you sound like a good match if you actually make it clear what you don't want. So he's asking about the STAR method. And there isn't enough time to go through like every popular method out there. When you talk to the individual uh, career consultants, they can tell you what their preferences are. Um, and, uh, and the answer is yes. Should I try this method? Yes. Should I try this method? Yes. I'm not going to tell you there's one method that's better than any other. But I will tell you as a hiring manager whether I think your resume is understandable, whether it's persuasive. Okay. Um, so we talked about in the beginning about role and career progressions. If you are a junior guy, let's say you're a junior uh, IT specialist at uh, Northrop Grumman Corporation, and you help people, you do help desk work. Okay, you do that for six months. Sounds pretty good. Goes on your resume. Here's a book report resume. Junior IT help desk, Northrop Grumman Corporation, whatever. So, you know, uh, January through June. Okay. Well, that sounds like a decent qualification. 
But junior people tend to learn really fast. What do you like? What do you want to know about a junior person? Like how, how much they can grow in a role. So what if you had exactly that same line on your resume, exactly the same company, exactly the same experience, and you said, started out helping users, uh, start out, uh, starting out, uh, started out as a help desk support for uh, engineering users in so-and-so um, department, and within six months became the go-to guy for Linux on the team. Same line, but now it has presented you as somebody that a hiring manager is going to go, well, I don't have Linux right now, but what if I wanted it? Or what if I just need somebody that'll always patch my systems and like always be looking to do the next thing? They'll, ta they'll, they'll be persuaded that you're the kind of person they're looking for. So don't miss those opportunities when you're talking about roles. It's not a book report, okay? You're talking about your career arc. Oh. One, of the fav one of my favorite things that we talk about with other, career with other uh, hiring managers is the idea of hiring for culture and training for skill. Mm. Hiring for culture, training for skill. I like that quote. Okay, so um, also this slide should look familiar to people that were here earlier. We tend to overemphasize salary here in the United States. There's a few reasons, um, and the industry just encourages it, and this is very self-defeating because there are other aspects of compensation that are just as important as salary, and we'll talk about that in the salary and uh, in the interviews and negotiations clinic this afternoon. Um, also, whether or not you're a good fit depends on other aspects too, not just the salary range. It's the first thing we jump to because we're left brain thinkers. Oh, that's a number. I can hang my hat on that one. I fall in that number or that's more than I'm making now. That makes me happy, right? Must be a better job because it's more than I'm making now, right? Um, in your resume, you can specify industry, type of company you want to work for, role on the team you're looking for, and the, growth, and, and the growth potential is not necessarily something you put in your resume, but it's definitely something you're targeting in your next role. If all of these things match, what you want matches what the hiring manager has to offer, it, it gives the person across the table a chance to resonate with you and say, well, you know, I, I know this isn't really the salary you're looking for, you know, it's, you know because you don't, you, you don't really have the experience we need, but we have this opportunity where we send people to scale every year for, for training, you know, or, or every quarter we send someone on the team uh, to, uh, to go get a certification and bring that knowledge back to the team and do lunch and learns. Right? I mean, they could find other ways to satisfy your career needs. So the Raise Me approach, um, resume development is a process with a purpose. You're not just creating a resume. It's not a book report, okay? You need to discover your career arc, discover where you want to go in the longest run, and then determine what roles are right upon that path. Okay. You don't do that by looking at a job posting and writing a resume and sending it to that employer or sending it to 17 employers. Okay, that's not how it works. Uh, you create a master resume first. You start out with a narrative and create a master which becomes a kind of encyclopedia and then from there you create targeted resumes for each role. Okay. Um, the essay approach is something, it's just a term I use. I don't know if anybody else teaches this, but did you all learn how to write essays in high school? Okay. What, after, after the title, what's the first thing that goes at the top of a resume? Of uh, a resume, of, of an essay. <coughs> Topic sentence? Topic, your thesis statement? What does the whole rest of the essay do? It supports it. So if you're writing an essay about elephants and you have a paragraph about dogs, does it belong in that essay? No. So if you're applying for a job, if you want a job in the aerospace industry and you've got aerospace experience, but you also worked at you know, a car wash, what do you think goes in the resume? What do you think doesn't? 
So you put the things in the resume the hiring manager needs to see in order to determine if you're a good match. Okay? And the essay approach with a resume, what I call the essay approach, is you put the summary at the top. That includes the things we talked about, the industry, the type of company, the type of role, and the type of work. As a hiring manager, I think you've probably seen the same thing as me, you're lucky if you get one out of four or five of those. You find out what kind of work they're doing now. Maybe what kind of work they want to do next but you don't see anything else in the resume. It's all the rest is guesswork. Okay, well, he came from three other aerospace companies. He probably wants to stay in the aerospace world. Um, you know, or works for a startup, probably likes working for startups. It's all guesswork. But if you put it in a summary at the top of your resume, it takes all the guesswork out of it. You'll sound like a dead-on match for a role that, where those things are offered. So is that in your experience? Yes. You see what kind of work they did. How often do you see what kind of work you think they want to do next? So what, the work that they want to do next, you're saying for the role that they're interviewing for? Yeah. Well, for the role they're interviewing or for what it, whatever they want to do next that they haven't done before. Do you ever see that in a resume? Uh, explicit listening, not doing it, no. So you won't even know if you're a good match. I can promise you that if it's on the, the next role in your career path, you've been successful, you'll look like a good match if you say that's what you want. Start out by saying that's what you want. That makes you a good fit. Um, also, you'll find when you create a master resume, there, is a common, there are common threads that pop through. And this, this happened in real time for me a few months ago when I was mentoring a college student. Graduated from CSUN, uh, double, uh, two degrees, physics and some kind of engineering. Uh, very, high, very highly accomplished, high grades, um, and a couple of internships, which I feel were probably prestigious, but that's not my world. Um, and so extremely qualified, but never had a, world, uh, a job out in the wild, out in industry. And so, we're, and so we, he had basically an academic resume and it had to be completely redone. He wasn't understanding why he wasn't getting calls back. Because all he talked about was being a TA. So, and you know, well, he's capable, he's brilliant, he's capable of doing all these things, but he didn't say he wanted to. Okay, so we rewrote his resume and in the process of him creating his master, he found out something about himself. He found out that all the way back to high school, every time he was on a group project or worked on a team, he was the guy that always did the data analysis. That he learned how to use Excel and be a real wizard at Excel when he was about 13 or 14. But he, he was the guy on the team that would create fancy spreadsheets and would do graphing and real stuff in the background. And it had carried over into his college life where he was a top achiever. And still on every group project, he was somehow the guy that was running statistics and doing uh, risk analysis work and, and, and other kinds of work. And so it, was, uh, it, was, it isn't the kind of work he wants to do. He doesn't want to do data mining for a living. But he understood what role on the team that he could make a really strong argument that he qualified for. And as a junior person that's never had any industry experience, sounding like a perfect fit for an engineering team in any kind of role is a big asset. So before you go into interviews, this is, this is by the way, this slide is from my hiring manager lecture, okay? Here's what I tell hiring managers. If you don't look at all these free public resources on the internet to find out what candidates are finding out about you before you start interviewing, you're a fool. There's all things, there's be things being said about your company, about your CEO, about your business partners, about your stock value, out there on the internet that gives people impressions. And if you don't educate yourself about it, you're, what, you're, you're, you're hurting yourself, right? So let me give you this slide. As candidates, here's where to find it, okay? Now, this doesn't mean you believe everything you read. But like, just like advice, you're going to get input from everywhere. It's going to help you decide what to ask. So you read the CEO has funky pictures with someone that's not his wife. Okay, you don't need to ask about that in an interview. Right? But <laughs> you might want to ask about a recent merger you heard about. What's the chance they're going to eliminate... Uh, you know, the IT support personnel in that merger, right? There are things that are worth asking. Even if the manager doesn't have the answer, it shows that you're really thinking about long term in the role, okay? Uh, there's one here that is interesting. I have never used this blind. People that use it are, uh, find it very compelling, so I just want to mention it. Um, it's, a, it's a website that you can go to. 
if you have a job offer and you can compare with employees who have accepted offers who are working at these companies and find out how your offer compares to what they got in their package, their compensation package. It works because the only way you can register there is if you have a corporate email address with that company. So if you want to find out about, oh, Facebook is one of our big sponsors. You want to find out about Facebook.com and whether your offer kind of matches what everybody else is getting, you can go on there and talk with real Facebook people. So, uh, qualifications. So, um, your resume is going to summarize your qualifications for a role. A particular role that you're applying for. And here's four things that are going to be on your resume. Skills, experience, accomplishments, and education. Okay? These are the ways that you're going to convince Matt that you're the person that can solve his problems. There's two kinds of qualifications. There's conventional qualifications that you're going to see on every job posting. College degree, so many years of experience. Okay. Um, then there's going to be unconventional qualifications. Let's talk about conventional qualifications to get that out of the way. We all know all what this is. The first one that's very important is that you're leaning over in the current role. You have experience that's very close to what they're looking for. If some big operation uh, wants somebody, uh, DNS is on my mind because of our keynote on Saturday. So if some big operation needs someone to revamp their DNS architecture um, uh, and, uh, and you've, and you've supported DNS in a previous life um, and you want to do that go, and, and, you want, and you want that to become your specialty going forward, you do more of that, you also emphasize that on your resume. Oh, well I did these 10 things. Of these 10 things, one of them was a DNS architecture task. Well guess which one goes at the very top of that list? Be it's going to be the DNS task. It's going to be the thing that you want to do next on your resume because you want to emphasize that. That's the thing you want to talk about. And you don't exaggerate. Never exaggerate on a resume. Don't be modest either. This is just plain facts, ma'am. Okay? If there is a number you can associate with a, with a bullet item, if there, if there is um, analytical credence you can get, you need to do that. So I supported 5,000 users, um, you know, uh, 300 virtual machines, uh, you know, built 20 systems, right? Put a number to things so the hiring manager gets a really clear idea of what you've done. Do not exaggerate. Okay? They're going to catch you. <laughs> it's not worth it. Uh, another thing, so leaning over the current role is one thing you do. Another thing you can do is casual consulting on 1099. So companies have much uh, more relaxed requirements when they hire consultants. So you can do this as a side job. Put it on your resume. Uh, college degree certificate programs are the most expensive way to build a, uh, conventional qualifications, and they're recognized by everybody. Uh, industry vendor certifications and training is another kind of expensive way to do it. It takes a little bit less time. Okay, so these are conventional qualifications. Every HR department in the world is going to love to see these. Okay, and here's a, a summary of open source qualifications that are pretty common. Hmm? Let's ask our hiring manager. You have an opinion you'd like to give? So I don't know particularly to hire for the technical world or for the project management world, but um, I would say that it shows that you've gone out and you've taken the effort to learn this skill and, and prove that you have that. that He's specifically asking about CompTIA. All right, so here's another question, right? Would you value more like an actual degree, like, 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 like even an associate's, right, like computer science, versus someone that has like a bunch of certifications? So I would say that your work experience would be more important So how many people have been told by a recruiter, get certifications? Put them all on your resume, no matter how old, right? Get as many as you can. Have anybody ever pressured you to get as many as you can? Okay, the reason that that happens is because there are search engines out there that are just blindly parsing people's resumes and looking for matches, and they'll report 70% match. 30% of the keywords match, that's really low. 50% of the keywords match might be somebody's threshold for actually downloading a resume and taking a look at it. They're doing keyword searches. You can create resumes that are very effective at keyword searches without compromising the quality of the content. So, I'll tell you... Are you addressing ATS? So, uh, you know, we could, we could talk about almost all these. I'm just afraid we're going to run out of time. So, can you do that? Can you ask somebody in a one-on-one -on -one appointment? Okay, if any, unless somebody else has that question. 
But, so the point that I want, okay, so, all right, well, maybe we'll circle, back, we'll circle back around to it if we can. So the point I want to make about certifications is you can have too many. That is a piece of stupid dogma that's out there. Hiring managers are looking for a balance. We want somebody who can get the job done. If you get your master's degree, we're looking for the promotion to lead position afterward, okay? Not degree, 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 and no changes in your work, okay? There are some people that just sequentially get uh, certification over certification. It's something they enjoy doing. That is not a career path. That's not what managers are looking for, okay? If you get a certification and then you do a certain kind of project related, let's say you get an information security certification, a security certification, and now you go rebat, and now what you do, you put on your resume and say, I went back and rewrote all my old Python code. Or now, I, you know, I, I, now I'm mentoring other JavaScript uh, programmers. You put that on your resume so that there's this balance between certifications and achievements, okay? hope that answers the question. Uh, anyway, so yeah, it's a little bit of alphabet soup, but we want to work with you one-on-one, -on -one. okay? And every manager is going to have a different opinion about whether they like certifications, how much they value them, and which ones. It's so different from position to position to position, right? So we can say, well, you know, what's the best one of these? The answer is it depends. And how do you tell? You go on LinkedIn and you see what the guys and the gals who have the position you want already have at a given company. Go check out Netflix and see what the Netflix SREs have, right? I just want to give a, a, a quick little story about certifications. I worked for a company uh, that was, did managed services. We hired somebody to manage our, our network engineering team. He had just gotten his uh, CCIE. He was gone within a month and a half. Why? Because he, he had the certifications didn't have the experience, he didn't know how to manage, he didn't know, he was terrible at network engineering, he was terrible at it. So what, what, what happened? So he was gone out, right? Yeah. And and I it, don't have a CCIE, and I was, I was the vice president of technology. So yeah. that's the difference between getting it. If you get it, and you use it, and you know it, then it tells people that you know it. But as a hiring manager, I don't look for just so how does that happen? How does a person without certifications get overlooked for a job that this person is more qualified for than somebody that has three of them? How do they get overlooked? What do we talk about? They don't have experience to back up the user. If they do, what if they do? He's saying that in his case, he has no certifications at all, but he's eminently qualified. So how do those people get overlooked? No, their resume is crap! Yes! The resume says, I have certifications, or they don't. Here's another thing that happens. Or the HR department is looking, yes, right. And this is why I do Raise Me, guys. I try to educate HR personnel on how not to fall into that pit, okay? So either the resume's crap, or what's going wrong in the interview process? That, was that, that information is not on the resume, so it's not coming out in the interview process, where they're resonating with, I solved this problem already. Okay. Uh, so if you have a, a higher number of certifications, would you recommend that that goes into like a master list and then you... Exactly. Put everything. I want to know everything all the way to the, to the uh, good citizenship you award, award you won in kindergarten. Put it all in your master resume. Get it out. That's your master profile. Okay. That helps you. That release. That frees you to write a targeted resume that has a lot less in it. And it will just be the things that the manager needs to see. I need to move on a little bit faster. Okay, so we talked about some of these things already. So unconventional qualifications. If you don't have a college degree that's on the mark, if your previous work experience has nothing to do with what you really want to do next, there is hope for you. We specialize in that at Raise Me. I wrote a talk on this, and my first talk I ever gave was here at Scale a few years ago, just how to re-career, okay? Um, and I get uh, people... People ask me to come to their conferences and tell them, okay? So you could do volunteer work, you can contribute to open source, all this stuff goes on your resume. It's just as important as your conventional qualifications, okay? You could speak at user groups, you can do online skill builder sites, you don't have to be enrolled in university, okay? Uh, in InfoSec, there's competitions, but there's hackathons, right? There's all kinds of things you can do that don't even cost any money, and Mr. Nathan's right back there. We have our expert in how to, how to, how to increase our qualifications for open source roles. Um, and this is what you do instead of exaggerating on your resume or instead of just saying, oh, they'll never hire me. This is what you do. You build up your unconventional qualifications if you're recurring from somewhere else. 
Okay. Here's the dogma about resumes. All right. Uh, everybody's heard these pieces, these pearls of wisdom in one form or another, and boy, does this drive me nuts as a hiring manager. But you'll find that these two people sitting here don't agree with me on all these points. Okay. But we'll go through mine real quick. Okay. Exact length. How long should a resume be? One page. Everybody disagree? Anybody disagree? Okay. Uh, give me another number. How long should a resume be? Two pages. Okay. So I submit to you, that's what that is. If you write your master resume, which has 10 pages of stuff, and you pull over just the items that apply to that hiring manager's role, and it is two and a quarter pages long, Every single line on that resume is something that hiring manager wants to read. Why would you cut it down to one page? You want to talk about it in the interview, right? You're not going to talk about the bicycles you rebuilt when you were a teenager. You're going to talk about things that actually apply. But if you, if you use that discipline when you write your targeted resume, it's going to be exactly the right length. So let me ask you another question, which I'm sure everybody is going to agree on. How long should a book be? Okay, exactly the right length to tell the story, right? Okay, all right. So there are other things. Be general, we talked about it's important to imply the things you don't want to do, as well as include the information about what you do want to do. It makes you sound like a better fit when there is a good fit. Passing with bud words. We talked about this, only the ones that apply. He doesn't care about, no matter how sexy and state-of-the-art your work is, if, he's, if it's not going to apply to his job, he doesn't need to know about those buzzwords. Oh my goodness, I, I, honest to God, the last time I did the very last resume review I did, somebody was, had the very first acronym he had on his resume was Visual, was, was visual Basic related acronyms. Visual Basic. This is a Python programmer. Okay, why is that first? Why is that even on his resume? Because he thought he had to have everything on it and he was listing it in order. Well, what order should it be in, guys? Who's reading the resume? What order should it be in? The order that it applies, right? The thing you want to talk about first or most. Maybe it's not necessarily what Matt's looking for, maybe it's what I want to do next, so I'm putting that first. Don't bury the lead. Don't bury the lead. Sometimes recruiters will encourage you to put everything because they want that high percentage of matches. If you feel like you need to do that, if, if it's tangential but it sort of applies, de-emphasize it. Put it at the end of a list, not at the very beginning. Okay? Don't need every certification. We talked about this, just the ones they're looking for. Uh, don't blitz your resume because you send one version out, you don't get calls back. Guess what you've done? You messed yourself up. Formulate section titles. You can get creative with section titles. I, with the people I work with, I do so much volunteer work, and the people I work with, they do excellent work. We'll give them uh, section titles that say volunteer work, hackathons, people that write CTFs. CTFs they've authored. How about cool stuff I did? Cool stuff I did. There, you don't have to, you know, salary, you know, employment history, uh, education. You can come up with, if you have a whole bunch of information that you want to categorize and emphasize, it actually distinguishes your resume to create a creative heading. Okay? Here's another piece of wisdom that really bugs me. I work a lot with people that are re-careering. Uh, or what I call restarting, uh, people that have taken off, say, to, to raise children. And so they were once at the top of their game, and now they've been out a few years, and the world changed, and now they're having trouble getting calls, okay? They are often told not to emphasize employment gaps, so just don't mention it, you know. Um, that's not what you do. In my, in my opinion, the strongest resume for somebody who is re-careering or restarting is one that talks about the employment gaps. But what do you talk about? So between, you know, June and December of, uh, you know, uh, 2019, what do you put in there? Leave it blank? What you did during that time. What you, what, but what you do during that time? Do I want to know that you repainted your house? Related to your career. So give me an example. You weren't working. Nobody was paying you. So what, what were you doing? You were oh, contributing to open source. Maybe you were, uh, no, this is, this is real-time example, woman that, that took off. Uh, was, uh, um, she was at the top of her game, 
in the information security industry, she took off for four years to raise her toddlers. She, couldn't get, she wasn't getting any valuable leads and wasn't getting calls back on the roles that she wanted. Had a, had a big gap in her resume, was always apologetic about it. I found out when she wasn't employed, she founded, a, it's a little off target, but she founded a Java user group on Meetup. They met every single week. She taught other people Java. Just, just, and that demonstrates leadership, initiative, curiosity, programming skills. It, and she was a security professional, but she didn't stop. Every CTF she went in, none of them were written on, none of it was recorded on her resume. And she was the top female uh, winner in every CTF she'd been in for years. She'd show up, she'd always take, she wouldn't be first necessarily in the CTF, she was always in the top 10. She'd be the, the top, number one female. Boy, isn't that persuasive. None of that was on the resume. So my point is, is that there's so much you can say. If you just even have a hobby that's related, it gives you something to talk about. I built a server at home. I am running Linux. Got a firewall. So what about you took a like, Same thing. Self-care. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. 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 You, you don't have to, uh, you don't emphasize it. You de-emphasize things that don't matter. But if you've done something, if you wrote a book on your sabbatical, which is often what people do, well, you know, you, be t you learn while you're writing. You never really know something until you teach it, people. So how are we doing on time? We're supposed to be done. Well, we started late. We're supposed to be done about 1. We'll go until about 1.30. So the rest of these slides we can go through a little bit faster because I think we've covered most of it. Um, Oh, self-descriptions, this is where people say, I'm a motivated self-starter. Uh, well, you're wasting your breath. Uh, telling me you're a highly motivated self-starter doesn't persuade me of anything. And, you know, you put something else on your resume that means something. Let me be the judge of that. He's laughing. But people think this is really persuasive, right? And exaggeration, we talked about that. Okay. So here's the resume development process. This is a real resume, a real raise me volunteer said we could use it. We started out, he's a college student, we started out with narratives about every job he's had and his volunteer work at scale. Okay, and that's, that's the beginning. So he's written everything he can think of that, that somebody might want to know about. And then we work together and we convert it to bullet items that talk about accomplishments. Okay, you were at scale, but you ran cables. You were at scale, but you helped diagnose network problems, right? Uh, here's what you did in open source, you know, different things that you worked on open source, that kind of thing. It's where you actually get down into the details about what you did. And, I'm um, sorry? Every single thing you did. Every single Every thing. Single this thing was, this is his page one, and he has no work experience in the industry, <laughs> and that was page one. Every but this, story you have about yeah. I'll tell you his story in a minute, but here's what the final targeted one was. He, he actually, he applied, and he's been applying for internships with it. So he, so he looks at the internship, he, and he goes back here, he refers to his master resume, and he pulls over just the things that matter, putting them in the order of the emphasis he should be making in order to prioritize what he talks about in the job interview. And this is, exact, this is one of his targeted resumes. Okay. That's what it looks like. Uh, oh, now the rest is about uh, kind of side issues. Um, and so it's, it's, it's content that I offer if there's time, but I want to find out what the audience needs. So this is for consulting. If some people are considering, oh, I want to be a consultant next, and I have a group of that, then we can go through this. Um, there's all different kinds of consulting, um, and then a little bit on interviews, but we're going to do that later. So, okay. So let me tell you Tyler's story. Uh, that's the sample resume you saw. 17 years old, high school junior. Never had a job. Uh, grew up in my family, which means he grew up doing scale every year. <laughs> You'll see him running around looking really tired, <laughs> probably with tape stuck all over him, <laughs> um, doing game night, running cables, basically being a gopher. Anyway, he grew up with this, and he's gotten more and more responsibility over the years. Before he started at scale, he, uh, before he started uh, volunteering at scale, he did other volunteer work, like every summer, at the end of summer, every August, he would go to my daughter's elementary school and in every classroom set up the teacher's computer because they get locked up in this room. Do you know how frustrating it is to teachers to, to, to a dusty dead computer in the bottom of their cabinet have to set it up and get it to work? And, uh, you know, oh, it's got a, you know, it's got a um, 
as soon as it comes up, it has to synchronize antivirus, signatures, and just all kinds of stuff that they don't understand. Little things could go wrong. He would do that for every teacher at my daughter's school, and he was a hero. <laughs> well, so he put, he put that volunteer work on his resume. He's, nobody ever paid him to do anything. He put that volunteer work on his resume, and there was one... In the process of creating his master resume, he remembered one special um, moment that he had doing this work. One teacher was ex exceptionally flustered. Um, she had one of those rooms that's always piled high with papers and art supplies and stuff. The kind of fun teacher that's great to have, but doesn't like computers. She's actually kind of afraid of computers. She sets her computer up, and, and she's so grateful. And as he's walking out the door, he sees this stack of cardboard boxes kind of doing this, looking dangerous. And he says, well, hey, can I help you with these boxes? And she's really touched, and she says, well, I, it all has to go in these cabinets and these shelves, and I have all this stuff to do, and my computer wasn't working, and it's no problem. He stops for a few minutes on the way out the door, and he takes care of unloading all of her boxes for her. Little event, doesn't mean a lot, but the fact, and it wasn't in his master resume, but the fact that he wrote that master resume entry about that job, or that, about that task, reminded him of that. 17 years old, he's applying for his first real job with a first real big company. Never made, nobody ever paid him a dime to do anything. He walks into the lobby, there's two other 20-something adults there. They're not even minors, they're full adults. Both of them have work experience, working for exactly the same kind of company, tire company. And he just, his first thought when he walks in, I have no chance. <laughs> no one's going to hire a kid when they have these two guys sitting here. This is not going to happen. He goes into the interview and they start talking. They, he had this targeted resume and he started talking about his experience. And he remembered the story about this teacher and how just offering to do this little thing for her just changed her whole, probably it started her whole school year off a lot better. But it changed her whole feeling about her job that day, having somebody on the team like that. He shared that story that, oh yeah, I, I, let me tell you about, you know, in the context of, I don't have any paid customer service experience. No one's ever given me a dime to sit behind a cash register and take money. But I did do this one thing for a teacher once. They hired him. They hired two out of the three people there. He was one of the two. And he's not, he wasn't even 18 years old. He had a badge, benefits, he had medical insurance, he had training. He was, really, I was a consultant at the time. There were plenty of weeks he made more money than I did. Anyway, so that's my story. And I'm telling you, everybody has a story like that. But if you just jump forward to just writing a targeted resume and just blitzing everybody with that resume, you're going to miss that process of figuring out who you are, what, cre what, your, what your career arc is, what's going to make you happy in the long run, and what anecdotes you can share with a hiring manager that will resonate. Okay? So that's the end of the formal presentation that I have. I do have other comment content for other subjects, but we'll, you know, uh, we'll, we're going to hang out till about 1.30 on this. Um, are there any, did, did we, so this is the first time that Bryna and Matt have joined in on this. Thank you. Everybody say thank you, <laughs> Bryna and Matt. <laughs> That really puts people, it really puts people on the spot, but I brag that no two group clinics are ever alike. No two, and this is a different, this isn't, usually the group clinics are kind of a different setting. So this is a little bit different for, even for a group clinic, but it really puts people on the spot. Don't you get spontaneous, honest answers out of people when they have no idea what I'm about to ask? Right, isn't that great? Put them on the spot. He's the guy that's on the other side of the table when you want a job making a certain amount of money, right? So who in the audience has a question?